Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Fiber Broadband Association's Five for Breakfast. We're now in our 30th episode of 2024. Can't believe how quickly the year is going by. Uh, before we kick off, I'd like to thank Wesco, the platinum sponsor of Five for Breakfast. You know, in Washington, D.C., uh, NTI continues to approve Volume 2 proposals. The latest approvals include Utah, the Northern Mariana Islands, and the U.S. Virgin Islands. That brings us to a total of 23 states and territories that now have their NTI B2s approved. So we only have 33 left to go. And we are just days away from our annual Fiber Connect 2024 conference, July 28 to 31. Last week, registrations for Fiber Connect surpassed their previous record from last year's conference in Orlando, and we're on pace for about 5,000 attendees this year in Nashville. So if you haven't registered, please do so ASAP. And after Nashville, we'll be in Des Moines in September, Calgary in October, and Albuquerque in New Mexico. So you're not gonna to wanna to miss those regional sessions. That brings us to today's Fire for Breakfast session. Our guests are Ryan Roberts and Dave Thomas from Shepherd Mullen, who will be discussing, take your marks, Colorado Broadband has stepped up to the starting line. Before I formally introduce today's guests, I'd like to introduce Dave Norris from our team, who will uh, walk us through some housekeeping items. Thank you very much, Gary, and thank you to everybody who's joining us today. We appreciate it. Uh, before I go over a couple of logistics, we'd like to once again thank our platinum sponsor, Fiber for Breakfast, Westco. Now, if everyone will keep in mind, all participants are in listen-only mode today. To ask a question, please type your question into the question box located within the control panel on the side of your screen. We will have a Q&A session uh, with the panelists uh, at, uh, during today's session. We want to get to your questions, so please do type them into the questions box. This presentation is also being recorded and will be available on FBA's website within 24 to 48 hours. And you can find that recording in the events tab under the Fiber for Breakfast drop-down option. Finally, at the conclusion of today's presentation, you'll be prompted to complete a brief feedback survey. Please take a moment to do so. We appreciate your input. And with that, I will pass things back to Gary and our guests to get us started. Gary? Well, thanks, Dave. And good morning. I'm Gary Bolton, the President and CEO of the Fiber Broadband Association. Last week on Fiber Breakfast, our guest was Brian Darr from UCLA, who discussed compared de comparing delivered versus perceived network performance. Brian highlighted why many consumers are signing up for gigabit services, but their broadband experience is being impacted by their in-home Wi-Fi network. You know, I always love having UCLA on fire for breakfast as Brian always has interesting data and stats to share. Today on Fire for Breakfast, our guests are Ryan Roberts and Dave Thomas from Shepherd Mullen, who will be discussing, you know, take your marks, Colorado Broadband has stepped up to the starting line. Ryan is a partner at the government practice of Shepherd Mullins in Washington, D.C., and is a leader of Shepherd Mullins' uh, GovCon commercial products and services team. Uh, Mr. Roberts counsels and represents government contractors and grant recipients of all sizes and all aspects of government contracting, including bid protests, claims, self-disclosures, internal, external investigations, audits, and false claims act litigation. Mr. Roberts, also the co-author of GSA scheduling or schedule handbook, a leading treatise on commercial products and service contracting. Mr. Roberts has significant experience in helping commercial entities comply with the terms and conditions of grant awards, including those made under the um, ARPA and capital projects fund and state and local fiscal recovery funds, um, as well as the broadband equity well be. So Dave Thomas is a partner in the business trial practice group and a member of the firm's communication industry team in Washington, D.C. office. During his more than 30 years as counsel to the nation's top cable and broadband companies, cable and telecommunications trade associations and other business organizations, as well as fiber optic broadband providers and private equity investors, Dave is a nationally recognized authority on utility and telecommunications infrastructure, pole attachments, right-of-ways, federal, state, and local broadband, telecommunications, regulatory, and communications, plant deployment issues, and public law, or public utility law, um, handling matters in more than 40 states. So you almost have to have a legal degree to go through all that. So welcome, Dave and Ryan. I really appreciate you guys being here. With that, I will turn it over to you guys. 
Thanks, Gary. Appreciate you having us back here. We did that event in the in the spring with with some of our other friends uh, in the consulting space. So it's great to be back here. Uh, the, the long and short of uh, the introduction there is I'm the lowly government contracts lawyer that ISPs now really, really want to talk to about how these federal grants work. But Dave Thomas is the true brains of the operations here as the, the leader of our, our communications group. Um, what we thought made sense, just kind of where we are in the timeline here, is to talk about Colorado. Uh, Colorado is this the first that I've seen of a, a public notice on a draft grant agreement under BEAD. I, I know our team has negotiated, I think we're over 100 ARPA agreements to date, but this is the first BEAD one that we're getting our hands on. Um, so it's fascinating to look through, see the differences. So we, we wanted to highlight some of the key points, our, our main takeaways, it, in part because you all have an opportunity to weigh in. Um, typically, you, you get a draft agreement, you mark it up, you send it back to the state, you, you go through that song and dance. This public notice and comment period is a little unique. So anyone on the line here can submit public comments on any aspect of the agreement they want to. So we thought we'd give you all our uh, our take on that draft agreement. And then you know what you should be thinking about, the volume twos are getting approved. As Gary noted, we only have 33 left, but that means that there have been a substantial number already approved. Applications are, are being submitted in some states. We have a handful of states that have already accepted applications under their programs. Uh, so the, the time is to get to work and maybe it's just the type A lawyer in me, but I, I think planning is very important here. I want to know what I'm getting into before I submit an application and sign any of these agreements. So I, I think that's what Dave's going to walk through with you all too, is just the mechanics on pull attachments and rate negotiations and how you plan for some of these build outs, even in an area where you probably already have some operations or you, you thought about expanding your network to in, in the short term. Um, and then we, we've got some questions, so thank you. I think three of you submitted questions in advance of the session. Uh, Gary will tee those up for us towards the end, but obviously feel free to ask anything else. Even the, I think David said to put them in the chat there, and we'll do our best to address all of your questions in the next 22 minutes or so. Um, but let's focus on Colorado really quickly. So public notice period is open through the end of August 12th, so you've got a couple weeks left to review the agreement, submit your comments. Um, I, I want to talk a little bit about the mechanics first here, because again, me, lowly government contracts lawyer, oh, and, and Gary, I appreciate the call out on the GSA schedule handbook. Yes, the, the 932 page treatise on the GSA schedules program. If anyone is having trouble sleeping at night, send me an email and I will be happy to ship you a copy of the book. Uh, it, it, it's a great substitute for melatonin. Um, the, the mechanics here are really interesting. So as I mentioned, we've negotiated a bunch of these awards under ARPA. The NTIA guidance differs significantly from the Treasury guidance. And what that means is how Treasury decided to administer these awards under ARPA is different from how NTIA is deciding to administer these broadband infrastructure awards under BEAD. And the, the number one thing we were looking out for in this agreement is how the agreement was structured, because in my space, that really, really matters whether ISPs are going to be treated as true subrecipients under the grant fund, under the grant regulations, that is a loaded term. Um, or if they were going to be issuing fixed amount sub awards, which is kind of like grant procurement light um, that kind of excludes a number of the really, really onerous regulatory requirements for grant recipients. So we were thrilled to see Colorado took the fixed amount sub award approach. Uh, that's consistent with what we're, what we're expecting and where we think other states are going to land on this. NTIA did everyone a favor back in May by issuing their guidance and essentially giving states an easy button to make these awards easier to award, administer, perform, not only for ISPs, but also for the state. So we're thrilled Colorado took that path. Um, and, and why it's important for, for ISPs on the line, there are a number of regs that don't apply. So most importantly, the procurement regulations of the uniform guidance. So these are the regulations that dictate how, for example, you would identify a fiber supplier, equipment supplier, buy those products to then use in your build out. The NCIA guidance came out and said, if you receive a fixed amount sub award, then you can rely on your existing commercial processes. You don't need to develop a new procurement policy procedure on how to identify suppliers, how you have to vet them, the type of competitions you need to do to ensure you're paying a fair and reasonable price because you will not get a reimbursement request approved and you won't get paid by the state if you're not paying a reasonable amount for the equipment. So by issuing a fixed amount sub award, you guys don't have to worry about any of that. You rely on your existing commercial processes. That's good enough for however you do your commercial build, you can use that same process here. So again, easy button, great, great win for ISPs. Uh, just sticking on payments, it, th there was one concerning part here in, in looking at where you maybe if you want to submit comments, what are the things that are worthwhile to submit comments on? 
how you're actually going to get paid matters. Uh, and this is not the uh, the textbook uh, definition of a clear and concise grant agreement. Um, States have, have some flexibility in how they structure payments to ISPs. Typically, in government contracts world, you submit your invoice at the end of the month, you get paid whenever the government decides to approve the invoice. The BEAD NOFO and NTA guidance provided three options states can use for payment. So one, you get partial payments upon completing certain milestones that are agreed to in your contract. Two, you get paid on a unit price basis. So think of like if you light up 50% of the houses required under the agreement, you get 50% of your payment, right? Or three, you just get one single lump sum payment at the end of program performance. To me, I'd rather have funding as I'm going to continue funding the build out. So I like option A a heck of a lot better than B and C because at least in my experience when ISPs do these build outs, you don't light up 10 homes out of the time until you get to a thousand. You build the infrastructure, you kind of light it all up at once at the end. So B and C practically, as my clients have explained to me, kind of the same thing where you're going to get one lump sum payment at the end of performance. So we were looking to see what those milestones were going to be so that you all can get interim funding to continue funding your operations in the build out. The agreement is is really lacking in this respect. It's circular. There's a main agreement and a statement of work attachment. The main agreement says, hey, look to the statement of work attachment to figure out when you're going to get paid. The statement of work attachment says you're going to get paid in accordance with the main agreement. Nowhere do they actually say this is how you're going to get paid upon achieving X milestone or X time frame, whatever it might be. So for me, that's that's one of those things that I would really see clarification on. I, I suspect the intent was for the state to establish milestones. And what they were trying to say is those milestones will be determined when we negotiate your agreement. But that's not what this says. This is just a circular agreement without any clarity. That's one of those things I think it's worth a discussion with the state. So if anyone is is so inclined to submit comments, for me, that was one that was ripe for discussion. Another one along the same line, audit requirements. So we're outside counsel. Uh, number one question we've been getting is, how am I going to get audited? What do, what do those audits look like? Do I need to submit them annually just at the end of the program? What are the potential negative financial implications if I don't do great in an audit? Um, there are really robust audit requirements included in the agreement for municipalities, localities, if they decide to be involved in doing some of these buildouts. There are no requirements explicitly laid out in the agreement for for-profit entities. So as for-profit entity, I want to know how I'm going to be audited against what standards I'm going to be held and what the potential negative consequences are. To me, it's a huge gap in the agreement. Again, it's one of those points where I think it's worth uh, seeking some kind of guidance on. The, the last thing that stood out to me in, in our space, there's, there's a concept called termination for convenience. And what that means is the federal government can terminate your contract at any time for any reason, as long as it's not in bad faith. It is a very one-sided provision. It's the clause our commercial entity clients have the most trouble accepting for the first time coming into government contracting. Um, essentially what Colorado did here was made a one-sided clause, even what more one-sided in their favor. The agreement says that they can terminate you anytime and essentially not owe you a whole heck of a lot. Whereas in the traditional government contracting space, if you're terminated for convenience, the government owes you a reasonable amount for all of your work done to date. You can negotiate some level of profit in there. Essentially what Colorado has said is, we're going to terminate you anytime and we're not going to pay you anything more. So again, it struck me as particularly harsh and one of those things that was worth a, 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 a comment in a public comment filing. Lastly, the, the, there were three quirky inclusions in here, and I don't understand why they were included. Again, I suspect they'll be part of some people's public comments. I don't know if it's worth any of y'all submitting comment on these points, but I found it to be interesting. Um, number one, Colorado uh, reserves the right to approve both your subcontractors and the individual subcontract agreements. So if you have a construction company that's going to go out and do your build out, you have to submit both the name of the construction company and the actual agreement to the state for review and approval. If they take a while to review those agreements, that could really hold up performance and threaten your timeline you committed to in your proposal. We've, this consent to subcontract concept isn't foreign. I don't think I've ever seen an agreement where a public sector entity actually wanted to review your subcontract document before you could continue with performance. That for me is just rife with potential for problems. Second, uh, they invoked the FCC at some point. I actually reached out to Dave when we read this, like, Dave, well, what the heck's going on here? Why would they involve the FCC? And the specific point is on the reasonableness of costs. 
So say you paid X amount for a piece of equipment and the state of Colorado contracting officer doesn't know if that's a reasonable amount to pay for X, X piece of equipment. They say in the agreement that the FCC is going to be the final arbiter on whether or not it is a reasonable cost. I don't understand why the FCC would be involved there. They do not have the expertise to make that decision. We deal with reasonableness of costs all the time in the government contract space. Never once have I seen that authority try to be delegated to a federal agency by the state. The whole setup is extremely strange. So I'm curious to see any explanation out of Colorado for, for why that's in there and if they, they change their tune. And lastly, reps and certs always give me um, always give me concern. Uh, anytime we have a false claims act case, it, it involves some form of a representation or certification. The draft agreement requires you, the ISP, to certify that the addresses you're building out to have a need for this better broadband service. Uh, there are a few metrics in there, but essentially that's what they're saying. Y'all aren't making that determination. The state's making that determination. They're telling you which homes to build to because they have already decided a need exists for better broadband service in those unserved or underserved locations. I don't understand why you would have to present some kind of a certification on that front. If anything, it just gives a whistleblower some basis to make a claim against you in the future. I don't see what the state gets out of it. It was just a puzzling inclusion to me. So again, I'm looking there for some explanation for the state to even understand what they were trying to achieve, but if not, to try to get that thing removed. So at a high level, those are my big picture takeaways from the 64 page draft agreement that Colorado posted. Fascinated to see what, what comments come through. Uh, but now that we have the, the draft agreement, Dave, what, what should these folks be thinking about in terms of infrastructure and how to build out if they get one of these Colorado awards? Um, thanks, Ryan. Well, they, they need to be thinking about a lot of things. They need to be thinking about, and I, I hate to say it, but you need to be thinking about pole attachments because if you're building into unserved areas in any, in any state, most of your network is going to be aerial and it's going to be fiber optics, which means that you're going to be attaching to utility poles owned by others. And typically those utility poles are going to be owned by the electric, by the local electric company. Um, before I get into that, I just want to, um, comment on or riff off what, what Ryan was saying about uh, con contractor approval and the FCC supposed approval or being the final arbiter of, of whether costs are reasonable. Um, th those two things seem to me to come reflexively from a um, very kind of old line view of public utility regulation. Um, retail electric public utilities that are regulated by the state, um, companies like um, in, in Colorado, like XL Energy or um, or uh, Black Hill Energy, Black Hills Energy, have their rates and their terms and conditions regulated by the Public Utility Commission. And some states, and I don't know whether off the top of my head, Colorado was one of them, but some states require that all contracts be approved by the regulatory agency so that they can determine whether the particular agreement for widget purchases or uh, uh, you know surface services or contract ser contractor services are, are reasonable and prudent which is one of the standard public utility law cost metrics in terms of the FCC determining what is uh, what is what is reasonable from a cost standpoint with very very limited exceptions the FCC has been completely out of that that realm of cost of service regulation for at least uh, 30 years. I mean, they did have a foray in the early 1990s when they were regulating the rates of cable television providers. And then, of course, the FCC, one of the two main reasons that the FCC was established back in the 1930s was for electromagnetic you know, spectrum management and interference, primarily among broadcast stations, but also they were involved in setting pricing for the monopoly telephone companies at the time. But by and large, certainly within the late 1970s and early 1980s, they started migrating out of this cost of service kind of um, regulation. So that is, is, is puzzling and I'll be really interested to see um, if that comes under in Colorado, this, you know, the scrutiny of commenters and whether that that gets that gets modified. Um, as to the things that you need to be thinking about, you need to be thinking about. I'm going to say it again, and it's it's a four letter word: poll, P-O-L-E, P -O -L -E, polls, polls, and more polls. Um, Colorado is is um, well, poll, so poll attachments are well. Let me put it this way: there are there are basically three kinds of 
of electric utilities in, in the United States and including in Colorado. There are investor-owned utilities, big companies like XL Energy or in this area, um, you know, where I live in, in, in Maryland, uh, Virginia Power, which is just across the river or, um, you know, uh, uh, Pepco, which I think is now Constellation Energy, these these are bigger invest big investor owned utilities. XL Energy and Black Hills Power are the two investor owned utilities in the state of Colorado, but vast parts of the state are also covered by electrical cooperatives, um, and the third kind are municipally owned electric companies. So there are only two investor owned utilities in the state of Colorado. They cover a lot of customers and a lot of geographic area, but a lot of the rural areas where you're gonna be building to will be in those areas where cooperatives provide electric power. And also in some of the municipalities, which also sometimes supply power beyond the corporate limits of their, um, of their city. Um, it's important to note that for investor-owned utilities, the two the two big ones, XL Energy and Black Hills Power, their terms and conditions of attachment and their rates, uh, the basic reasonableness of contract terms, the basic reasonableness by which by the timing by which you need to be allowed to have access to the polls, that stuff is regulated at the FCC. So. Um, I know I said a minute ago that the FCC is not really into regulating costs. They sometimes will get involved in a rate dispute in the poll attachment context, but it only applies to the investor-owned utilities. In terms of co-ops and, and municipal-owned utilities, there is not much regulation at all in Colorado. There are in some other states, including states that aren't so far away from parts of Colorado, like Texas, where there are regulations that apply to cooperatives and municipal utilities. But what does this mean from a practical standpoint if there's not regulation? What it means is that you have very, uh, you have to be creative in searching for and asserting leverage in negotiations because they have something that you need, something that you want, and they're the monopoly provider. You need to be on the poll line. There's only one poll line in typically in any given area. So you're a little bit at their mercy. Um, the, the, the equation becomes a little bit more complicated when you take into account that cooperatives uh, in various places around the country, and I'm not sure if it's true in Colorado, but I think it is, um, where some of the electrical cooperatives themselves have broadband affiliates, and some of those broadband affiliates will be, you know, competing for uh, the funds that are here. And one can imagine that if they have their own broadband affiliate, they want to be building fiber in their service area, and then and then I come along and say, please, sir, may I have pole attachment rights? You could see them say, no, that's okay, Dave. We're good. We got our own. Um, you know, have a nice day. Um, conversations don't typically go like that but that's that's the upshot of it and it's just something that needs to be factored in um, in terms of substantive terms of, of that you would be looking to want to negotiate in your poll attachment agreement especially important for the municipalities and the cooperatives um, is are, are things like how long do they have to respond to an application? What are your application application and permitting requirements? Do they have, you know, you want to set deadlines by which uh, access has to be granted or by which they give you what's called a make ready estimate, how much it's going to cost to literally make the poll ready for your attachment. So that is, that. those are a few of the very high level things, um, I guess, very generally, if, if I were uh, giving advice to folks who are kind of new to this for the first time, with a very big caveat that you get what you pay for, um, I, I would want to have some idea of what terms and conditions should be in your agreement as a poll attacher, as opposed to just relying on and completely trusting the template form that the local um, power company will give you. Because I think in the first instance, um, especially in the municipal and in the cooperative realms, maybe less so from the investor-owned utilities, you may be getting an agreement that is not going to be super helpful to you in deploying. I'm, I'm hey, Dave, Dave let's, stop, yeah, let's get into some questions. Um, so I really appreciate you guys setting up. So the first thing, you know, given that you guys have been digging into Colorado, um, you know, Colorado has a, a lot of community broadband providers. 
but what you're you know given what you're seeing what kind of providers do you think will be able to um, apply for B giving the complexity and what you're seeing in the um, application? Um, I, I'll, I'll take the first shot at this, Ryan, unless you want, want to. Um, I mean, I think it's in, in a, it says it's going to be no different than what um, any in, in any other state. You're going to have a mixed bag of in, in, incumbent telecom and fiber players and cable companies. I think you'll have some new companies who are are looking to take advantage of the speed opportunity because um, some non-trivial part of the financing for these projects is going to be paid by you know paid for by Uncle Sam and by we loyal taxpayers uh, on this webinar today. And um, and I think you'll also see a number of kind of uh, public kinds kinds of entities. Do you think broad based? Uh, I mean, because one of the things that would give me pause if if I wasn't a big provider is what Ryan started off with is how are you getting paid? Um, if you're a small provider waiting till the end is not going to work for you. Right? Even just getting a match, a letter of credit. I mean, these things are really complex. And so all of a sudden it just, you know, leaves you with deep pocket guys. Is that what, I mean, so Ryan, what are your thoughts? Yeah, no, that, that's the concern. And the way this thing was structured from the top down, it's a statute through agency guidance, through state awards, was to encourage participation of smaller ISPs. Uh, we were involved in a lot of the direct negotiations with Treasury and NTIA on how to structure the program. And they really did want to make it accessible for smaller entrants into the marketplace. They did not want it to be dominated by the big ISPs. So that's why you see things like the fixed amount subaward to reduce the regulatory requirements. You see streamlined application process, uniform requirements across states. Like they, these are all things that were intended to make it easier for ISPs. Obviously, it's a business decision for a smaller ISP whether to take the funding or not. Um, but what I will say, we're, we're focused on Colorado. It, this is a test balloon, right? Every state is watching this agreement to see the comments that are submitted. So if you're a smaller ISP, the program is giving you some concern, but you don't intend to participate in Colorado, still use it as an opportunity to voice your concerns because changes here likely will flow to other states. Uh, yeah, and, you know, Colorado, I mean, again, you go down the corridor and there's community after community that's launching broadband projects. So if anybody's going to do community broadband, it's going to be Colorado. And it'd be a shame if, you know, this was so complex that, they weren't able to do that. Uh, so yeah. your um, question or concern about, you know, punning on cost to the FCC, uh, one of our FCC experts um, had commented that they're wondering if FCC would rely on CostQuest to um, look at the forward look, um, looking cost models for universal services to determine whether costs are reasonable. And, you know, they've done that kind of assessment for the FCC, for New York and others. Um, so is that what you think would happen is that what they're yeah that's uh, actually that's actually a great a great point i i didn't even you know when when i was raising that in his presentation i wasn't thinking so much about usac and the and the universal service types of calculations so um yeah that that would be uh a big exception to what i what i was saying before um and i'm going to go out on a limb and, and say they, they probably would um i i would be yeah, very does a great job and they have a good relationship especially with the mapping and so um, what about given your expertise with ARPA and capital projects and now with B, is B more or less complex with respect to obligations, oversight, compliance than these other programs? More, more, and intentionally so. Um, during negotiations, we tried to get NTIA and B to take a uniform approach on a number of these issues. And NTIA's response always was, just because they're doing it that way doesn't mean we're going to two. So we see some of the procurement standards that do apply, some of the property standards that do apply. Fixed amounts of awards a great middle ground, but it's not e actually the easiest option for ISPs. That would be treated as a contractor where virtually none of these regulations apply. We do have contractor agreements that came out of ARPA. We're not seeing that here. So it's more, but it's certainly less than full-scale government contracting. All right. So, I mean, certainly I want this to be as easy as possible because I want as broad a participation as possible because I want everybody in Colorado connected with fiber. Um, and so hopefully people can work with companies like yours to help them get there. In. So, okay, you talked about submitting public comments. Um, what what is What's the process other than just typing in your comments? Do you guys go and meet with the Colorado Broadband Office, explain what your comments, do you get invo NTI involved or what What should people do? I mean, they just submit them, type in their questions or their comments or how, how should they move forward? 
Yeah, that, that, that's up to each ISP. Every ISP is going to be handled it differently. Uh, on behalf of the bigs, our response will be much different than on behalf of the smalls. <laughs> There'll be more dollars invested there. But if you're a small ISP, yeah, you can go right online. There's a public comment form. You can fill out the text box, submit it. There's an email address. So if you wanted to mark up the agreement and email it, you can send it straight to the box. So like you as a single person can do that without spending any external resources. If you want to engage outside help, like, yes, we will be submitting a letter with detailed comments. We'll be sitting with a marked agreement on behalf of at least one client. We're proposing to meet with them on behalf of that client. So we'll, it, it all depends on the particular company. All right. Well, I have a million other questions, but unfortunately, we're out of time. But um, again, I really appreciate, Ryan and Dave, what you guys are doing and companies like yours to help um, ISPs and communities be able to participate in this amazing opportunity. And I'm hoping that it's not uh, um, too much um, trouble for these guys to be able to apply. Um, Steve was asking um, for a link to the draft, which I'm not sure what draft. Um, we'll have, make sure we'll get a link to that. All right. Well, um, I want to thank you guys again. And I hope that you, we can get together next Wednesday. It's going to be exciting. We're going to have Sean Henry, the CEO of NHL's Nashville Predators and Bridgestone Arena discuss hockey, community, and fiber, how each foster growth with each other. This will be, um, I'll be talking with Sean at Fiber Connect. We're going to do it on the big stage and record that for our guests here that will be virtual. So I'll see you guys in um, Nashville next week and uh, here Wednesday for Fire for Breakfast. So thanks, everyone. <laughs>